been tempted to say Merry Christmas. <laughs> I have like said that three times this morning alone. Uh, so, okay, today is a beautiful sacred day of differences. Okay, today is a different day. It is a different year. And so, so that we can celebrate and honor that a little bit more, you're going to take your bulletin today and, and set it aside because there's a, a few little typos in there. So you're going to see some differences this morning, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, also, you may notice that, that communion is not in your bulletin. Again, this is one of our bulletin differences. We will be celebrating the Holy Sacrament of Communion. Uh, but, but today, as we get started, if you didn't know this, then this is a day of, of what I would call theological dyslexia. Okay? Anybody else here ever wrestle with dyslexia? I'm highly dyslexic. Uh, that's why I have to read the scripture like five times before I come up and read it for you, and I still get it wrong sometimes. Um, okay, so as we shared a while back, on January 6th, the 12th day of Christmas... It's actually Epiphany Day. And Epiphany happens to come this year in the latter part of next week. But for the Christian calendar, Epiphany Sunday isn't next week. It's this week. All right? So we're going to start by celebrating Epiphany today. But because it was stuck in this interesting space in between, next week, if you didn't know this, our youth are actually going to be leading service. Now, if you didn't know what Epiphany is about, Epiphany is the season in the church where, where we are challenged. It's right after Christmas, okay? Uh, it'll lead us up to Lent. And it's the season in the church where we are challenged to look at scriptures that literally sound like what it is, Epiphany moments, where people are just floored and they go, oh my goodness. Well, then this baby really is the Messiah. I mean, the guy that we've been talking about for like 2,000 years, that's an Epiphany, a realization. Where somebody goes, wow, did you just see? He, he helped that guy. Jesus helped that guy walk. He took his first steps at the age of 50, and we got to watch it. This is an epiphany. Where somebody hears the word of God preached, and they go, I've never thought of it that way. Or I needed that in my life. Or I needed that moment of clarity. Or wow, that, that just really helps me out so much. These are all moments of epiphany. And traditionally, the church of old, has used this day, Epiphany Sunday, to talk about the story of the three magi, the three wise men that came to visit baby Jesus. All right? And in this element of just taking everything we got, bulletin and a little, few other things, and just setting them aside, if you've been with us during the Advent season that leads up to Christmas, I've been challenging us once in a while to take our traditional understanding of the Christmas story of what we see in the plays, and we see in the plastic figures and yards and all that such. Don't throw it away, but set it aside for a minute. Because when we dive into the Word of God, Scripture, there's actually a lot more depth and wisdom in there through the culture and through the teachings of God. And I'm going to ask you to do that again on this beautiful Epiphany Sunday. So, we have some announcements for us. Uh, first of all, following this service... We would absolutely love it if you'll stick around and join us in the fellowship hall. We are kicking off again something we, we've done for years, and we haven't done, uh, we've been waiting for the new year to come before we started it. This is our, uh, our covered dish lunch, our potluck lunch that we do on the first Sunday of every month. Okay? Uh, we call it Lunch Bunch. Now, if you didn't bring something to share, don't worry about that. We have tons of food. We would rather have you than your stuff. And nobody knows who brought what, so don't feel ashamed. Okay? So just come and join us for that. Also, would you turn me down? I feel like I'm echoing. Testing one, two. This is the day. Perfect. Thank you. This is the way it is. Isn't it? Can you still hear me? It's still doing it! All right. I told you, this is a day of differences, isn't it? Yeah. It's all right. Satan will not win. We're going to keep going. Okay. If you can't hear me later, raise your hand. But my wife tells me I have a big mouth, so this should be okay. All right. I turned it off. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Potluck. I still do that. I think it might be that mic right there. The choir mic. 
Um, so pop up after, after the service today. Uh, next week, as I shared with you, since Epiphany's in this in-between time, next week the youth are going to be leading service. And this is really fun. I shared with you that the traditional story we talked about is when the Magi visited baby Jesus. Next week, that the youth are going to be doing this fun, lighthearted skit during the sermonic time. They're leading the whole worship, music, everything. But they're going to be doing this lighthearted skit during our sermonic time of, of theorizing what would it have been like if the wives of the wise men got together while they were gone, had lunch, and talked about their husbands. Okay? And it uses scripture in there, and it's just a lot of fun. So I want to invite you to come back and check that out. Lastly, I want to let you know, and, and this is especially for our, our friends online as well who are watching. Um, I want to let you know that in two weeks, so January 15th on Sunday, um, we are going to be starting our broadcasting probably about 10 to 15 minutes later than normal. So if you come and you don't find us, please, uh, please stick around. We will be on in a little bit. But the reason why is because, uh, as many of you know, there's a lot of potential changes coming to our denomination. That there's, there's a lot of information that's been thrown around. And, and over the last few years, we've worked really hard to keep you as up-to-date as we possibly could about all of these potential changes. Uh, your, your church council, your worship committee, several others, I've been speaking with our leaders, and, and we feel like this is a good time to bring the congregation up-to-date on everything that's going on. We want you to be fully involved so that you know what's happening with our denomination uh, on a national, a state, and a Salem church level as we move forward. But I will share with you the same thing I did two years ago when we first started talking about this. When and if anything changes, the day before, we're going to worship God, we're going to love each other, and we're going to be the church. The day after, we're going to worship God, we're going to love each other, and we're going to be the church. Salem will still be family. Okay? And no matter what happens, because we're family... We'll figure it out together in the, in the love of God. Anything else for the good of the family? Y'all pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this chance to come into your home. We, we pray, Lord, that whatever it is that you have for us, that we be open to it. Lord, help us to not just be looking for what we want, but on this Epiphany Sunday, Lord, whatever it is that you would teach us, how whatever it is that you would guide us, encourage us, mold us, shape us, Lord. We seek that you pour that into us, that we may have a revelation of being with you. And in the same way, Lord, we pray that all we do here is worship in your eyes. As we ask this in Christ's name, amen. amen. Please join us in our hymn of praise, and it is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now remember, you put your... Bulletin aside, <laughs> Just and for what we're doing is singing a Christmas song on Epiphany. Hey, there's no problem with that. So it's number 240. Hark the Herald Angels sing. Please stand and sing. <laughs> Oh, 
Bibles, grab them with me. We're going to head over to the book of Ephesians. If you don't have them, it will also be on the screen. Uh, but the book of Ephesians, New Testament, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And as you're on your way over there, let me give you a little backstory here that may help a bit, okay? Because um, this is a little bit more of a thicker, uh, a heavier, uh, uh, a more difficult scripture. Not in this context, but he's trying to describe something here. Paul is trying to describe something that there isn't words for, you know? So, so this scripture can be a little hard to understand without context. Really what Paul is trying to say here is he's saying that God sent Christ for everyone. Not just for the Jewish people, but the Jewish people and everyone else. What the Bible calls Gentiles. Okay? And, and he sent Christ for everyone so that we all may experience something amazing called the grace of God. Grace is the unearned, undeserved love of God. You and I, we didn't earn his love. We don't deserve it. But he gives it to us anyways. In the same way of a mama caring for a baby. Okay? And he's saying because of that, you, know, you don't have to shy away from coming to God, talking to him. You know, it, it's not just the pastors and the priests and the rabbis who can talk to God. You can because you don't have to already be good enough. God loves you right where you're at. Even if you weren't born in the right family. That's what Paul's trying to tell us here. So check this out. This is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Listen to this from the Word of God. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you, Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly, in regard to this, then, you will be able to understand my insights into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people of other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs. Children, inheritors, together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the workings of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given me. To preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. Which from ages past was kept hidden in God. Who created all things. His intent was that now, through you guys, the church. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Y'all, this is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We go to the next slide for me, please. We have a tradition here at Salem that on the first Sunday of every month, not only do we conclude our service with the opportunity to receive the Holy Sacrament of Communion, which we'll talk about later, but we join our voices together with many others. The Apostles' Creed is, is a profession of what we believe, that not only Methodists, but Lutherans, Episcopals, Anglicans, Church of God, millions around the world have used to say, we have one Jesus, and we together worship that one Jesus. I invite you, if you will, if you've never heard this before, then just listen. And if you have and you believe this, say this with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you'll stand that, oh, go back one slide for me. Just very briefly, you can go back one slide. That's okay. Um, you notice that it says that we believe in one, uh, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That's lowercase c. In other words, the Latin word that means universal, not uppercase c, as in the Roman Catholic Church. We are saying all those who accept Christ were part of that family. So I just always like to clarify that when I can. We go on the next slide for me. Thank you. I want to invite those of you who are able to stand as you are able and join us in singing the glory of Hunter. much in the past, I'd like to say, if you don't worship here regularly, don't feel pressured to give. This is a covenant that those who are members of this church and regular attenders make. Just know that we love you. response for all that God has done for us in our lives, is doing and will do. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the doxology. <laughs>
We seek to give our very selves over to you, our time, our talents, that we can tithe our very existence. And in so doing, God, please speak into us whatever it is you have for us. For we are your worshipers, not the other way around. And so we pray, Heavenly Father God, that as we give this back over to you now, and we take a moment and we join our voices together as one, that this would be beautiful to you as we together say the Lord's Prayer, which is also on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we are not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Children's time, yes. Thank you. Y'all may have a seat. I want to invite the children, anybody 11 and under who would like to join me to come on down. I want to invite the rest of us to join me in singing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Have you ever seen motions like that before? No? This is something called sign language. There are some people who can't hear like you and I can hear. Sometimes it's like their ears are plugged, and others, they can't hear any sound at all. So a way that they can communicate is called sign. And what we did was we used the end of that song and we signed, yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. All right. I think maybe we need to start doing that song twice over because these kids are, are great and they actually wait for each other to get to the bottom of the stairs before CJ they... CJ makes us. CJ makes us. Well, good. Because yep. we need to take care of each other, right? It's part of being family. Okay, oh, here go. Ah, that's a long way down. All right, so for those of you that don't know what's going on here, CJ's got the box. There is something. What's that? I had the box for a while. You've had the box for a while. Because you didn't come on Christmas. There's something in the box. I don't know what it is. He's going to make me, or he's going to make them guess, and then I have to come up with a lesson. Okay? So, what's your clue for us? Something you got for Christmas. Yeah, that's not very helpful. <laughs> science. Something science. That, 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 thing, that thing that you dissect no jelly animals with? Nope. Not a dissecting animal. Um, did you bring it before? No. Okay. It's one of the things that burns. You can see what stuff looks Ah, a microscope. Is it a microscope? Close. 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 Magnifying glass. Magnifying glass? Way cool. Way All right, cool. I, th I think you stumped us. Go ahead, show us what it is. But you take pictures with. Oh, it's, that's interesting. It's an eye clops. It's an eye clops. May I see it? Yeah. Thank you. So what this is, is kind of like you were really close. This is like a microscope. You zoom way in on something. It helps you magnify it a lot. And then you can actually take a picture of it. All of it. How cool is that? And I remember when I was a kid and I thought that getting a bicycle was like top technology stuff, right? Okay. So this is actually pretty darn cool. I like this. And you know what? This is something that these adults, we really need to talk about just as much as we need to talk about with you guys. Because one of the things we can do with the Bible is we can start to read some of the stories in there and we can get caught up in just the details. Who was there and who wasn't there and did it happen like this or did it happen like that? But, but let me ask you a question, okay? Well, all that is fun and it's interesting to think about. Is it really the point 
to know how many people were standing around when Jesus healed somebody? No. No. No way. It is, no is, way. It, is it the point to, to say Jesus was standing on this corner as opposed to two blocks away? No. no. Well, what's the point? What he did. Well, he did, right? Mm -hmm. You see, we, we need... Can I borrow your Bible for a minute? I love that Bible. It's beautiful. I've been hearing that you've been reading through this too. I'm proud of you. So, we need to remember something very specific about this. This is not just a history book. A history book records things that happened, and that's it. This is a book about his story. This is a book that tells the story of Jesus. And, and so, some people say, why aren't there dinosaurs in the Bible? Well, dinosaurs were real. They, yeah, they really existed. But did it have anything to do with Jesus dying for our sins and rising no. again? No. 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 So no. just because it's not in here doesn't mean that it didn't happen. But we also recognize that it's not just interesting stuff, but that Jesus loved us and that he died for us. He rose again. He's, he was sent by God. And, and he talks to people like prophets and preachers and even you to let you know how loved and special you are. And so in that way, we need to remember that, well, it is fun to look really, really close at things. The stuff that we take pictures of that we store up inside of our hearts is the fact that Jesus loves you. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who really did live. But to show me that love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, okay, well, actually, Addie and Max, now that they're back, they can have a chance to. Okay? Do either one of you want the box? Yeah? Okay, Max, why don't you take it this week? Addie, you can have it next week. Okay? Oh, you gotta do the same thing. And, um, and I'll get with Grandma, and next time that y'all plan to come, we can find time for you to get the box too, okay? All right. Y'all go ahead. You can head up to Children's Church if you want.
As the choir begins to make their way down, I want to invite y'all, once again, if you got your Bibles, grab them with me. And we're going to head over to the book of Matthew, chapter 2, first book of the New Testament, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Listen to this from the Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When the King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Y'all, he was disturbed before that. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all, uh, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, which is like the city, by the way. In Judea, which was like the county. They replied, for this is what the prophet wrote. This is from the book of Micah. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report it to me, so that I too may go and worship him. That wasn't what he was saying. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of God for y'all, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so this morning y'all are going to have to stick with me a little bit, okay? Because out of the seven years we've been worshiping together, I've only got to preach on Epiphany like two, three times. And the reason why is because usually the week after Christmas, my family's still out of school, okay? So that's usually a vacation week for me. And the, the, the Sunday of Epiphany is usually the first or second Sunday after Christmas. And so I've got kind of like sermon buildup in me, okay? So, so just stick with me here. It, it's going to seem like we're going to bounce around a little bit, but I promise it'll all come together in the end. And, and inside of that, I, I need to remind you. That this is a beautifully sacred, special Sunday that's a little different, and sometimes we need to set some things aside, okay? So, so take your image of those blow mold three wise men that we see in people's front yards, and just set it here for a minute. And don't throw it away, but inside of this, perhaps as we dive in, you may have an epiphany moment. There may be something in here where you go, wow, I've never known that about the Christmas story. Perhaps you've heard this story, the Epiphany story, many times over. And today, rather, it's something that challenges you or grows you or makes you think more deeply about the story that, that, that really happened with God's people. Today, maybe God might be challenging you to have your own Epiphany moment. All right, so holding on to that. So that aside for a moment. Okay, how many of you remember or grew up or got to see some of the good old TV shows like I Love Lucy, Dragnet, right? Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres is the place to be. Mary Tyler Moore, Dick Van Dyke, yeah, Gunsmoke, or MASH. You see, I was the odd duck kid, all right? And I can share this story because my mother's not here. My mother Snowbird's down here. She'll be here in two weeks, so I can share this now, okay, um, before she comes. But my mother worked from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. 
basically every day. Um, she worked hard as a single mama to, to take care of our family, and she worked cleaning the hospitals. Because she worked so late, I got to go to bed whenever I wanted to. And, and so while all the other kids were sitting there talking about what was happening on MTV, I'm sitting there going, you know what happened on I Love Lucy last night? <laughs> these were like my shows. I love these shows. But there was one show that my mother absolutely loved, and it was not on my top ten favorite, to say the least. It was a show about this young, spunky girl who lived in the country, who always was optimistic. I mean, why would a teenage boy like that, right? And it was called um, uh, Anne of Green Gables. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of it or seen that show. And out of the what felt like four million episodes my mother made me watch with her, and out of the two and a half hours each episode that it felt like as a teenage boy, there was one line of one show that I just could never shake. For someone raising you, sometimes it just sticks with you. And this line is just stuck with me. And really, it wasn't until I became a preacher that I went, wow, that's actually kind of a cool thing. You see that this little spunky, upbeat girl, one day she says, Tomorrow is a brand new day with no mistakes in it. And you know, as Christians, I think this has more power than, than we think. As those who are forgiven by Jesus Christ, washed clean of our sins, as those who you are not defined by the mistakes and decisions and shortcomings of your past. It doesn't exist. When, when we say you are forgiven, you are made new, born again, these are all images we use to help us know that you are not defined by your past. And so here's the cool part, okay? For us as Christians, this phrase, tomorrow is a brand new day with no mistakes in it, actually holds a bit more power. I mean, if you think about it, this second, wait, right now, it's literally perfect. It never been used before. And so is this one. And this one. And 2023. It's brand new. It is undefined. I mean, how many of us can really sit back and go, okay, look, I can help you define some of the years past by some things that have happened. 2022, 2021, what are they known for? COVID, right? Political upheaval, stuff going on overseas, problems with merchandise, getting stuff. All right? Well, we can define these years in so many different ways. We can put labels on them. We can say, oh, this was the year of X. But, but 2023 is brand new. It is fresh. It's never been used. And as those who are forgiven by God, we don't have to live like we're going to be defined by our past. I mean, if we're not careful, we get lost in the weeds of sitting there going, well, you know what, we are still got to deal with COVID, we still got to deal with some political garbage, we still got to deal with this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. And we're basically going to write off 2023 as if it's already happened. We're going to throw it away. Something that's never been used yet. We're going to act like it's already been defined as something before it even happens. All right. So, now that I've given you all that, I promise it'll all come together. Set that aside for a minute. I told you that today is Epiphany Sunday. I told you about the story of the Magi. And as I started diving into this, as, as I've got some sermon buildup in here, there's some things about the Magi that I've always found interesting. You see, I've done a lot of studying into this. And what, what you need to understand, first of all, is that, that there's a lot of controversy over some of the finer details, like we talked about with the kids, about what happened in this story. Did you know that we actually don't know if there were three of them or not? As a matter of fact, we don't know how many there were. The only thing the Bible tells us for sure is that there was more than one because it uses the word magi in a plural sense. There could have been as little as two. Some theologians believe there could have been upwards of 40 of them there. The only reason we say three is because of the three gifts. Okay? That's how that tradition started. You know, they actually weren't there the day Jesus was born. Yeah, there goes a lot of our nativity scenes, right? As a matter of fact, if you listen to the scripture we just read, 
What we find out is that these guys, these three magi, come to Herod, um, and they say, we have come to worship the newborn king of the Jews. We've been following this star. All right, we've come from another country. And when they go to visit him, it says they went into the house, the Bible says. Not the stable. They were in a house. As a matter of fact, if you keep reading past our scripture, what you find is that when Herod realizes that the, that the Magi tricked him, that, that he sends out a decree to have all the baby boys killed in and around Bethlehem that are two years old and under in accordance with the time that the Magi told him. That's what the scripture says. So the reality is, Jesus was probably closer to two years old when the Magi came to visit him. And what's even more interesting as we dive into this, that there, there's some controversy over how did they get there? What were they following in the first place? What was this star? Some have said it was an alignment of planets. Well, you mean that the planets aligned for two solid years and they followed that? Other people said it was Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet passed by that area in 12 B.C. So you mean they, they started following in 12 B.C. and they didn't get there until about 3 B.C. or 3 A.D. or something? Okay? That's a long time. All right? Others say, well, maybe it was, it was a supernova. A star exploded. A brilliant bright light in the sky. And this light burned until the moment that the Magi reached Bethlehem. And the moment they reached that city, the light finished burning out. And that's how they knew they were there. Even more interesting as we dive into this, this word Magi. I mean, this isn't a word we typically use, is it? In our English language or even anywhere else besides this one spot in the entire Bible, in all of our studies, we really don't use this word magi. What does magi even mean? We, we, we say that they were the three kings. The reality is they were not kings. We get this idea because of um, in Psalms 42, it actually prophesies that somebody's going to come visit the, the baby, uh, the, the newborn um, Messiah. It says in Psalm 72, 10 and 11, May the kings of Sheba and Saba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before them. But if you look into the Hebrew of this, it doesn't mean kings in the idea that we think of with a crown. It means a ruler or authority. A magi was actually part of a royal court. But what's interesting is the word magi, it's still used today in a very limited sense. Magi is a, a specific type of priest in a pagan religion called Zoroastrianism. As a matter of fact, the Zoroastrians still exist. There is a Zoroastrian church in central Florida, in Lake Wales, Florida. And the Zoroastrians, what they believe is that they can make the future happen by, by looking at the stars. That the stars predict our future. And so they spend forever studying the stars. And in this time and area, Magi were part of the royal courts of some of the countries. As a matter of fact, there's a guy, he's a king in that area, that in his chronology, in his records, that it says King Azaz II actually sent one of the Magi. He financially funded him to go. Okay? And so, let's, let's put this into context a little bit here, alright? Here are these three guys who aren't Jewish, who are not guaranteed that, that this Messiah is even for them, who is of a completely different religion, risking two years of their life to go and find this. On the off chance and then, real quick, let's, let's look very briefly at the gifts that these pagan priests brought to our Messiah. All right? There's, these, this is frankincense, this white stuff. Frankincense was used in the Holy Temple during Jesus' day. Whenever you read in the Old Testament, it says they burnt incense unto the Lord. This is what they would use, was frankincense. By the way, frankincense and myrrh, it's just tree sap. Of specific kinds of trees that, that only grow in certain mountainous regions, typically in Lebanon. And that's why it was so hard to get a hold of. But if you were to take this, this is just sap broken off of the tree, and you were to put it on hot coals, it would make smoke. 
And it would become an incense. This was the first form of incense. Okay? But specifically, they used frankincense in the temple. Back in the days of Christ and before, they, they didn't have embalming. So when somebody would pass away, if you know much about how a body deteriorates, after a certain time it starts to release gases. Those gases don't very, smell very good. That's why they would put their dead in a cave and cover it with a rock, just so you wouldn't have to smell that. Sometimes what they may or may not do is they would wrap the body in, in linen cloth, and they would gently puncture it so that when the gas is built up, it would have somewhere to escape. And if you didn't know this, what they would do is they would take over a hundred pounds of spices and incense, and they would cover the dead in it, usually mixed with oil so it would stick on their stay. Okay? This is what the women were doing the day they went to go see Jesus at the tomb. And the spice they would use, I think I hear somebody at the door. And the spice that they would use, actually, for that specific burial, is myrrh. Right here. In addition to that, throughout history, and especially in the Middle Eastern cultures, what's interesting is, um, is that gold has always been seen as a sign of royalty. I mean, if you had gold, you were lucky if you had a coin. It was just money, okay? But... If you were rich enough to use that to make jewelry, like necklaces and rings and whatnot, that was only something for the royalty. This has always been seen as a sign of royalty. What are the gifts that these three guys came and gave to our Jesus? Gifts of divinity, death, sacrifice, and royalty. Y'all, they knew exactly who Jesus was. And so one of the great parts about this, just like our first scripture says, that you don't have to come from the right family. You don't have to have a Jewish heritage or another kind of heritage. That, that look, if, if these are the first people that God himself chose beyond the shepherds to see baby Jesus, pagan priests, I mean, these aren't just guys that, that have done a lot of bad things. These are guys who led other people in doing bad things. No matter what you've done, where you come from, or what's been done to you, if God wanted this to be the first people to come and begin to understand what salvation means and forgiveness and who Jesus was, there's nobody that is too far gone. And you need to understand that. But in all of this stuff that we've talked about, in all of the... The, um, the theories and the this and the that, how many and, and what was the star and all this such. Just like we told the kids. Y'all, if we're not careful, we can completely miss the point of the story. When we take a step back, we realize this isn't just a history book. But this is a book of his story. Not only is there, uh, does it come alive, but, but there's actually more to it than what I've told you about. I mean, think about this. Now knowing everything you do, here's where it all comes together, okay? We have three pagan priests who are not guaranteed that they've actually found the star that they're talking about, okay? I mean, it's not like the Bible says, it'll be the purple one with orange spots. They just know it's going to be a bright star. They are leaving their country and going into a foreign land with a guy, King Herod, who is known to be a bit of a basket case, all right, King Herod actually had one of his wives killed because he, she thought that maybe she might rise up against him. He had two of his own sons killed for the same reason. He had that same wife, her brother, her grandfather, and her mother all killed. So, so Herod did all this. Herod is well known in the Middle Eastern community for being a bit of a recluse. And if you know much about Middle Eastern culture at the time, war was rampant everywhere. So, with no invitation and no announcement, this group of royals show up at Herod's palace. Y'all, what do you think Herod's thinking? They're here to start a war. They know they're walking into that room and there's a chance they'll never walk out again. They left their home and took two years out of their life from their families, from everything they'd ever known, their jobs, on the maybe, possibly, kind of, that this Messiah may be coming, but he's not for me. 
is for the Jewish people. They were willing to risk so much just on the possibility that this could possibly have an impact. And y'all, as we move into 2023, we can get lost in the weeds of just doing things the way we always have in the past. Okay? Of not challenging in our own spiritual life, just always doing what we've been doing. In ministries here at this church, just always been doing what we've been doing. And the only thing we're guaranteed that will happen is not that we will stay the same, but the only thing guaranteed is that we will actually get worse because the world is always moving past us. What if we took the same kind of risk? What if we said we're going to try to do something in our own spiritual life to grow in Christ, to grow closer to Him, to grow as a church, to grow as a community in God's love, and we're not even guaranteed this is going to work? It's such a risk that there's actually a higher probably, prob probability, you know what I'm trying to say, that it's going to fail. Okay? What if we took a risk and said, this is probably not going to work. That the only way this can work is through the power of God. But we are not going to define 2023 by the past because we are forgiven and washed clean in Christ. I mean, isn't this the story of Jesus? He stepped out of perfection. He had never experienced pain, suffering. He'd never been cut. He'd never been hungry. He never had to have somebody else, the creator of the universe, Try, chose to be so humble, he actually had someone else teach him how to walk. Has somebody else changed his back porch as a baby? Okay? He chose to do all of that with no guarantee that everyone would be saved. As a matter of fact, the great majority of people in this world will not be saved, unfortunately, the scripture tells us. Jesus stepped out of perfection for the maybe, possibly, hopefully, not going to happen for everybody, chance that you might come to know him and, and be saved. This is the story of Christ. This is the power of the, 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 the story of our creator with no guarantee because we have free will. And knowing that only a limited few it even work for, he was willing to take such a radical risk. Y'all, as 2023 comes in, and we start to think about that the fact that, look, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they all live next door to Bethlehem. They and their fathers and grandfathers have been studying this for generations. And yet they missed what was happening in their own backyard. It took somebody else who said, I'm willing to risk everything on the maybe that this won't work. But the miracle that I might have actually found the right star. So on this Epiphany Sunday... In relationships, friendships, in your own personal life, in your devotion to God, whatever. What epiphany is God calling you to? Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you, Lord, that, that you call us. That, that you do not define us by our past. Or, or the thoughts that we have that we shouldn't. Or the things that we want to say that we shouldn't. Lord, you do not define us by the mistakes. You're the one that makes us new and clean. Help us, Lord, to not only let go of defining ourselves by something else, but help us to take risks that will probably fail if it even means there's a chance that your kingdom may grow. We offer ourselves and all of us in Christ's name. Amen. I shared with you all earlier that on the first Sunday of every month, we take time to receive the Holy Sacrament of Communion. I want to ask Miss Priscilla if she would terribly mind joining me up here. She's going to help out um, and the ushers to prepare themselves. And, and what we're going to do, I just want to remind you, as I try to often, that this is not the table of the United Methodist Church, nor is it the table of Salem. You do not need to go here regularly to receive the Holy Sacrament of Communion. If you've accepted Christ in your heart, and you earnestly seek a relationship with him, you're welcome here. At the same time, this is never anything something should be, someone should feel pressured or pushed into. This is between you and God. But it is a great opportunity to experience his presence among us. In that same way, what we'll be doing is we'll be receiving today at the altar, because our poinsettias are still up from Christmas, yay. Um, we're going to invite you to just stand at the altar, if you wish. We'll come by and give you the elements I will give a blessing and then you, uh, dismiss you and the next group can come forward. The ushers will dismiss you by rows to come forward.
And as you do so, we invite people to come down the middle aisle, line up, and after you proceed, to go back around so we don't bump into each other. Will you go on the next slide for me? I told you all earlier that the Apostles' Creed was something that a lot of Christians use, regardless of background. Uh, so is this litany. Though the words may be slightly different, I find that many Christian denominations use this. So let us prepare our hearts through confession and openness. I'll read the parts in white if you'll read the parts in yellow. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not been loyal. We have broken the We have loyal to the most of all. We have not loved our enemies. And we have not heard our enemy. Forgive us and pray. Free us from Jehovah. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. I want to invite you to stand as you are able. Give each other high fives, handshakes, wave at each other, I don't care what. Just let each other know you are loved in the name of God. slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new promise, a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, Father, and he broke that bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. <coughs> Gave thanks to you, Father. And he gave that cup to his disciples and said, Take, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in your Son, Jesus Christ, we offer our very selves, our existence, in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union together with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim that most beautiful mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Heavenly Father God, if I may be so bold, I humbly ask you for it, your Holy Spirit, on each and every one of us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in this your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Ushers, I want to invite you to come 
And for those who wish to receive, I invite you to come as the Lord leads you and lie on here. So often we're not willing to take a risk. Even less often are we willing to take a risk if we think we're going to fail. In the name of Jesus Christ, I challenge you to go out and take a risk, thinking that you might fail, but trusting that God might do something with it. Receive that as your mission and your blessing. Go in peace. So the only thing we're guaranteed if we choose to do nothing is that we will move backwards. So I challenge you to move forward in the Lord, knowing that you move on with a fresh start. Receive that and go in peace.
please stand with us. German, uh, even in the Amish cultures here in the States, they do not celebrate December 25th as Christmas. They give gifts on Epiphany because that's when Jesus got his gifts. And children will often leave little things of hay and carrots underneath their bed for the Magi's donkeys or, or um, uh, camels. And they'll know in the morning that the Magi had been by to drop off the gifts, who the Magi delivered the gifts, because the carrots have been eaten, and the hay has been scattered around. That is fun, but that's not the point. It is interesting, it is helpful, but it ain't the point. Y'all, let us not forget the point of the Word of God. Let us not forget the point of Epiphany. Let us not forget the power of what it means to be changed by God and to know that 2023 can be whatever we need it to be through his power. We just got to be willing to try and to fail so much that the only way we can succeed is him. So receive that as your challenge, your mission, and your blessing. And don't forget you're welcome to join us for lunch afterwards. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.